Um, this is in many ways the most important slide um, because this slideshow, this slide deck, I will post it on my stubackpicks.com site, so um, take down that address. My presentation from yesterday will eventually go up. Um, I fell asleep last night, I have to admit, uh, at 9.30, uh, so I didn't get it done. Um, but that will go up there, what I talked about yesterday, oh, auto chip stocks, that will go up there either depending on how long a layover I have in Fort Worth tonight on the way back to New York, either go up tonight or tomorrow when I'm back in New York. This one will go up probably tomorrow morning. Um, so you can get this whole thing there, or you can do what many people seem to be doing, which is taking uh, smartphone photos. Um, there are a couple other things on here. Uh, I wrote a whole book about volatility that came out in January. Um, I don't have the ability to see through the walls. There's supposed to be a bookseller outside selling it. Um, if not, you can buy it on Amazon. Um, so anyway, what I'm gonna try to do today is convince you that everything else you've heard at this conference is wrong. Um, I get, you know, it's the last, the last day, so I've got a, for a sort of free shot. Um, but by that I mean that the people who are telling you that we're looking at a night, another crash as in 2007, two, you know, 1999, 2000, whatever, are wrong. Uh, the people who are saying that we're looking at an ex that this bear will go on, that this bull will go on forever, are wrong. Uh, I think what we're looking at is a period which is which is different than where we've been, uh, and that's why they're wrong, because what they're doing is basically saying, well, this this resembles this in the past, uh, and I think this this does indeed resemble stuff in the past. But you've got to go back a lot further than that, uh, because volatility runs in cycles. Uh, we haven't really had a big volatility cycle really since the 60s and 70s. So for most of us investing in the market, uh, I wasn't doing much in the way of investing then. I was just three years old after all. Um, that's a lie. <laughs> um, and so I think what we're doing is, you know, history does run in cycles. The question is what cycle we're talking about. And I'm trying to, going to try to convince you that this cycle is indeed longer. Um, this is the book, small commercial, it's pretty. Um, okay, so we're looking at an age of big volatility and, and those are the events that sort of brand themselves on our mind um, and depending on how you want to start this counting, you can either go back to 97 uh, and the Asian currency crisis where you had, uh, which this then bled into the Russian ruble crisis, uh, you had markets crashing by 75%, you had GDPs, the Indonesian GDP was cut in half, uh, the Russian stock market suspended trading. Uh, that was followed in 2000, 2001 um, by the dot-com bust, uh, where small dot-coms went out of business, big dot-coms like Nortel disappeared, uh, you had about $5 trillion in market value destroyed, uh, and then the most recent one, the global financial crisis, um, starting in 2007, going through 2000, 2008, um, 2009, resulting in something that many of us call the Great Recession, not quite a depression, um, but pretty damn painful. Okay, um, but that's sort of the big level. We're gonna dig down further. You've got uh, sector volatility. Uh, so what, what I'm interested in is these big shifts. So we got the Shanghai Composite uh, going up 108%, then down 30%. Uh, and then, then up another 20%. Uh, oil showing a 54% drop, and then another drop, and then another drop. And then we get this huge rally, uh, starting from the February lows of about 70%. What interests me here is the speed with which these changes are happening, because it's really extraordinary fa extraordinarily fast and something different. Um, the other thing that's different about this is that it's not just the stock market. Uh, the problem, the volatility situation extends to markets that don't normally have volatility. Uh, so in October, this is my favorite event because it's, it's so wild. Uh, October 15th, 2014, uh, the treasury market has a liquidity crisis uh, and it produces a drop in treasury prices uh, that the statisticians say happens every 1.6 billion years. Uh, okay, I mean, uh, 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 that's why I love it. It's a, it's a, it's a huge, exciting, and utterly meaningless number, um, but it's an unlikely event. 
Uh, and what I would argue is that unlikely events are happening more and more frequently. Uh, a year later, well, not even a year later, uh, three months later, you have the Swiss National Bank deciding to, I uh, can't even remember anymore, did it decide to stop defending the, the, the Swiss franc uh, against the, the euro? Uh, and you had a 41% intraday move uh, in the Swiss franc against the euro in London. Um, this is not over a period of, of months or weeks, this is one day. Um, and then even day-to-day -day volatility, with, which are not, things that are not associated with big events even in the currency market. Uh, one of the ways to track volatility in the market is, a, is an index called the VIX, uh, which trades on the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. It's in fact their index. It, it tracks um, changes in price for options used to hedge volatility in the S&P. So as people get more fearful, uh, the amount that they're willing to pay for a for uh, an option to hedge, to hedge uh, against losses in the S&P goes up. Uh, so that's why this is sometimes called the fear index. Um, so we had a change of, of 5.6 5 uh, in one day. Uh, and then these are other examples of either one, to one day or a couple of week changes. Um, and the, the, the bottom line on this is really, really interesting and important which is that the net move when all these big volatility events are happening when we get 31% lower and 41% higher uh, is a net of 3%. This is, not, this, is not, this, is not your, this is not a crash. This is, this is not a bull or a bear market. It doesn't follow the models. You're getting these extraordinary swings in short periods of time, which are really, really scary. And people do really uh, understandable but uh, they do things that are totally understandable because this looks like uh, a fearful event. They do things that, that in the long run don't help them. Um, in fact, maybe exactly the wrong thing to do because the net move on this stuff is, is very, very small, uh, at least in this period, which is why it's not, doesn't follow the normal sort of outline of events. Um, and I'd argue that right now it's typical um, that in August 2015, the VIX spiked to 41 from around 15, um, and then so you had a you know, uh, and then it dropped back to 15 by December. So it was a 61, a 62 percent drop, uh, and then it went up again uh, by January 21st to 71 percent, and then back down 14 percent in three sessions. Uh, currently, it's it's back at about 14.82. Um, this is not, a, this is not a, there's no dollar associated with this. It's like the S&P, it doesn't have a dollar in front of it. This is just what the index reads. Um, currently we're back down at 1482. Uh, it was as high as 2814 in fe on February 2nd of this year. So that's a 47% move in a couple months. Uh, I think this, this qualifies as volatility. Uh, it qualifies as, as producing the kind of headlines uh, that scare people, the kind of headlines that say, what should I do, what should I do, what should I do? Um, and I think that's a legitimate um, question to ask. One of the things about this is that um, it, this is even within the sort of history of volatility, this is a very strange period of volatility. The average on the VIX is about 24. So the, the current range, uh, you know, we're, we're sitting at something like 16, 17, 18 right now. So this, this is according to the level where it is historically, this is a low volatility market according to the VIX. But the swings in the VIX are telling you that it's a high volatility market. So it's a, it's a high volatility market starting from a low level of volatility. Uh, and if you see the, the range we're getting here, 52, 52 week range on the VIX, on the VIX is, is roughly 11 to 53, a huge swing. You know, that, that's what, four or five times five time swing. Uh, so we're getting low average, but extreme volatility of volatility. And of course, this being the options in the futures market and the wonderful world of Wall Street finance, there's actually an index which tracks the volatility of the VIX. So it's sort of second, second order. Does someone answer that? Um, and this is called the VVIX. It's also tracked, and you know, the symbols on Yahoo, it's not a hard index to track. Uh, but, but the volatility of the VIX, uh, the VVIX, set a new all-time record. This, this little volatility of the volatility 
uh, index only goes back seven years. So we're not talking about something that goes back to the Civil War. Um, we're talking about something that goes back seven years. But nonetheless, um, on 2000, in, in August last year, when we had that huge August event, when it looked like the market was going down the tubes, uh, and then it all recovered by September, October, um, the VVIX had a new record of 212. Uh, meaningless number to most of us. 52-week um, range uh, is 72 to 212, so you can see that it's really at the upper end of the range. But what's really interesting is that 212 not only set a new record, it was 46% above the old record. So we're talking about a huge, huge move in volatility, uh, even though average volatility doesn't look very high. Um, so why, do, how can we sort of explain what's going on with extreme volatility of the volatility index, on the other hand, from a very low level? Uh, one is that, is that Average volatility is being damped by central banks. Everyone still trusts on some level, no matter what we say about the Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank, the Fed, and we talk about the fact that their policy is crazy, um, or we talk about they'll never get out of this hole. Uh, the markets still believe, completely irrationally as far as I'm concerned, but the markets still believe in central banks. They believe that central banks are going to move in and save everybody's bacon when it comes to the time when the bacon needs to be saved. Now, A, I don't know that that's true, and B, I think we're coming to a point where the power of the central banks to save bacon is getting to be relatively small. If you were a pig right now, I think you should think about uh, the fact that they're not going to be able to save your bacon. The bacon is going to go in the fat and fry at some point. Uh, we're seeing that most, most obviously in the Bank of Japan, which is trying desperately everything you can think of to move Japanese equities and the yen and the Japanese economy, but nothing is working despite the fact that you've got a, uh, if, you, if you do the correction, if you do the calculation to turn uh, what the Bank of Japan is doing uh, in their smaller economy to what, the, to what it would be doing if the econ Japanese economy were as large as the U.S. economy, they're doing more than the Fed did to get us out of the financial crisis. And it's having no effect. And I think that's what we're seeing increasingly across the board. You know, if you're, if you're at a point, as the European Central Bank is, where your biggest policy move is to take interest rates that are already negative and make them more negative, uh, there's not a whole lot of impact from something like that. I mean, they're now talking about, was it a central banker or one of the, it was one of the national central banks talked about starting to pass along negative interest rates to depositors so that you can put your money in the bank and earn a negative 1%. Why would you ever do this? We don't know. I mean, my mattress pays me better than that. Um, my mattress is, I think, probably safer than most banks do. <laughs> I have a good mattress. Um, okay, another possibility is that, and, and we know this is true, you're seeing changes in the structure of the markets so that there are lots, it used to be that the only way really to hedge the S&P was to do it with options on the S&P 500. Now you've got lots of other options, which means the VIX probably is not as good an indicator of volatility as it once, once was. Um, changes in trading and trading strategies, I think you're seeing um, lower liquidity across most markets, which I think makes when, when you have a big event, scary event, and people go, oh, I don't know that I'll be able to get out of my trade, they tend to move faster, so you get more acceleration of volatility. But on the other hand, they sort of, when they're in the trade, they sort of feel, well, you know, this is the only trade in town. You've got a lot of volatility trading strategies right now uh, because it's one of the few things that seems to work uh, if you're a big institution. So you've got a lot of this action going on, which may depress volatility on the average, um, but also a lot of fear that what's going to happen is you won't be able to get out of these trades so that you may get volatility on a day-to-day um, -day level that's very, very high. Um, no one that I've been able to find knows why this happens, but volatility seems to move in cycles. So from 81 to 97, it was a very, very low volatility cycle. That's the investing experience of most people that are now in the market is their, their, this, is, this is their investing lifetime. Uh, I still remember talking to uh, if you remember, was it 86 or 87? I guess it must have been 87. There was a huge one-day crash uh, in the new stock markets as all the strategies that people had put on to protect them from volatility went completely haywire. Uh, that basically this was, you had a lot of computerized trading 
where the trading was designed to, well, when Procter & Gamble started to fall, uh, we, the computers would tell us to get out. And one of the consequences of that is that there were no bids. I remember that day sitting there and saying, oh, gee, that's really interesting. There's absolutely no bidding uh, on, S on, on Procter & Gamble, this nice, safe uh, company, uh, for a $5 range. There's simply what, nobody was buying because the computers were telling them that, you know, not to buy. And I remember talking to, to Paul Samuelson that day and saying, well, is this, you know, what do you make of this event? He said, who knows? He said, you know, we've got, we've got a relatively short, you know, at, statistically, we've got, uh, despite the people who want to extend the, the track record of the market back to 1870 or whatever, for all intents and purposes, the data on the stock market really goes, only goes back to the 20s. And so we're looking at a relatively short data span. It's going to be at some point, you know, before the sun goes supernova, we'll have a much longer um, data span. But what we don't know, and this is what Samson was saying, what we don't know is what the, the current piece of that longer data cycle represents. Does it represent an average period? Does it represent a, a, a period at one end of the tail or the other? We simply don't know any of those answers. So we really don't know why we get volatility. We don't know what it means going forward. Really don't even know where we are. But unfortunately, we live in the present, and that's how we have to invest. So anyway, 1981 to 1997, low volatility. Uh, 61 to 81, high volatility. Uh, this is the period of the Vietnam War, guns and butter, high inflation. We finally drove inflation up to double digits, uh, drove short-term interest rates up to double digits. Uh, and we had lots of bear markets, uh, 61, uh, 66, 68 in that period. Again, if you go back even further, uh, 1945 to 1961, low volatility. Coming out of the war, the US the only economy standing. Um, it was a period when, when the US economy was the dominant economy in the world. You didn't have very much in the way of either inflation uh, or um, variation in terms of economic growth. So high volatility is back. Uh, one driver of that clearly is uh, you know, central banks trying to get the most bang for their quantitative easing or interest rate changes buck. Uh, so they're trying to walk some kind of fine line between uh, shocking the market so much that the market does something really crazy, but shocking the market enough so the market actually responds to what they're doing. So you get things like um, in, Jan in February of 2016, the People's Bank cut its its exchange rate, it's, well, it's reference rate on the yuan to the dollar uh, for the largest amount uh, in six weeks, and the, market, the Chinese market sort of went berserk that day. Uh, so you're getting a lot of moves like that. Uh, people are now following the central bank in ways that, you know, I've been doing, I've been, I've been following the financial markets really now since 1983, 1984. I don't, I certainly don't remember in 84, I mean, it was the beginning of the sort of the, the rise of the super uh, high profile central banker. You had Paul Volcker, suddenly the most important person in the world. Um, but it's been a gradual process where, where more and more investors on more and more and more levels of the market are following central bank policy uh, as if it was the most important thing in the world. And I think that makes it the most important thing in the world. If people are bas basically moving a lot of money, depending on what the meeting is going to say out of Frankfurt, or Tokyo or, or Washington, uh, it becomes really, really important. And I think that adds to volatility. Um, and the other one is, is that trading patterns. Uh, the market is not dominated by individual investors by any means, but um, you're getting some pretty wild, and to my, you know, from my point of view as, as you know, a, a gray hair these days, uh, weird, wacko trading patterns. This was a, a study done by TD Ameritrade looking at where millennial investors, people much younger than I am, put their money in 2015. Um, and one of the things is that one of the top, so they looked at what were the most traded ETFs and stocks in 2015. And one of the ones on this list was something called the volatility shares three times long crude oil ETN. So basically this is an, an ETF, an ETN and an ETN is a slight wrinkle on an ETF. Uh, so this was a, a, an ETF that basically tried to, to get you, by applying its own leverage, tried to get you not just the, the change in volatility in the crude oil price, but three times that. So this was, you know, this was a really big bet on oil 
oil, crude oil vol price volatility. And this was one of the 10 most traded stocks by millennials in 2015. People decided that that volatility was here to stay and they would try to play crude oil volatility. Um, the other ones on this list are Apple, Netflix, uh, Facebook, Disney, uh, which I think is the Star Wars effect, um, Twitter, Amazon, Bank of America, which I don't know why that's on the list. That's the one that doesn't make any sense to me. Tesla and GoPro. Um, these are all um, news-driven, fad, or popular stocks. I mean, Apple is probably not a fad. Netflix is not a fad. Uh, GoPro is probably a fad stock. Um, my daughter built her own GoPro by, by taking her bike helmet and attaching her camera to the top of it with duct tape. She's 14, works just fine. Um, I think we spent $1.95 on the duct tape. Um, and she was very happy with it. It wasn't my idea, it was hers. Um, so anyway, but, but you look at these stocks and you go, these, if these are the most popular stocks. If you went back to my parents' generation, uh, you went back to my parents' generation, my parents didn't invest in stocks. I mean, they didn't own any stocks, but they, they determined that their, their children should know about the stock market. So they took me down to the broker and he recommended oh, really high risk things like RCA uh, or Procter & Gamble or uh, you know, CIT, oh, he wouldn't have touched GE, no, too, too risky. Uh, they, made, they made machines, we don't want to do that. We want to be in really solid consumer stocks, uh, TVs, uh, even though RCA is going to get wiped out by the Japanese, that was safe. Um, and, you know, uh, so it's very different, very different set of, of stocks that I think are on people's minds. Um, and I don't know whether everyone saw it, but on Tuesday, we actually had a Wall Street analyst put a target price on Amazon of, do you remember, do you remember the, do you remember the dot-com crash? A thousand dollars again. Yeah, I mean, this may be justified this time, but boy, did that send a shudder of, of memory through my, through me when I remembered, you know, uh, $1,000 for Amazon in 1999. Um, okay, volatility gets volatility. There's a, there's a fair amount of, of actual neuroscience research looking into uh, chemical reactions in the brain to things like volatility in Wall Street trading. There's actually a very good book um, which I cite in my book, uh, it's called The Hour Between Dog and Wolf, uh, written by a guy who was a, a former trader uh, on Wall Street who then quit that and got a PhD in neuroscience. Uh, you know, hey, what else do you do with your spare time? Um, but one of the things he was looking at was, was what happens uh, when high, stre high stress environments are replicated for a long time in a different way than we were evolved to do, that um, our Chemi brain chemical system was involved to basically deal with relatively short periods of stress. You know, the baboon sees the leopard and the baboon runs or picks up a stone and throws at the leopard, but the threat is over. In 15 or 20 minutes, the baboon is either, has either escaped or been eaten by the leopard, at which point the brain chemicals don't matter. Uh, Wall Street traders, however, go through periods of long, long periods of high stress. Uh, volatility doesn't last for 20 minutes, it lasts for days, weeks. Um, if you're in a, a, a bear market or bull market, um, big move, it can last for longer than that. And what the neuroscience suggests is that A, we get addicted to the stress, that the chemicals that, that are triggered by stress are in, indeed sort of pleasurable. They're, they're, they're more even, they're in the same family as the runner's, you know, talking about something similar to the runner's high, but this is the trader's high. Uh, and you get addicted to it, and as your body gets more and more, uh, more and more accustomed to the higher levels of chemicals, of these chemicals being produced by the brain, um, the brain sensitivity to those chemicals gradually goes down, which means that to get the same high, you have to do more risky, you have to, you have to ramp up the riskier behavior. Uh, and so he was looking at this and going, oh, okay, so one of the reasons why uh, markets go to excess, either on the upside or the downside, is that people are hooked uh, on their own brain chemicals. Uh, and they're not, they're not being very objective about this, they're basically responding to a, a pleasure uh, stimulus. Uh, the same thing happens in a different way uh, with pain, uh, that it can be so intense, these periods of stress that, that produce negative results, uh, that we get, you know, one of the things that he's looking to try to explain is why people don't buy at the bottoms. Uh, that people who have been burned stay out of the market. Uh, until, until it's time to come back in and get burned again. 
Um, but they don't buy at the bottom because they've had the experience of so much pain, their brain is saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, we're just gonna get hurt again, so let's not do this. And there are chemical reasons for this. It's not simply psychology or bad, in, bad judgment. Um, it's, if you know these things exist, uh, you've got a chance to fight against them, but one of the things that you don't know is that your brain is biased uh, by its own chemical um, addictions and fears. Um, and I would argue that, that, you know, those people at this conference and elsewhere, I mean, one of the things that I really find amazing is that I, if, if you spend as much time uh, on financial sites um, and reading financial posts as I do, uh, you of course get tagged by Google uh, and the, the ads that start to show up are tar targeted toward you as a consumer of financial news. The ratio of bulls to bear news that I get is really, really slanted toward, toward bears. Uh, I'm seeing right now, I'm seeing probably about three to one uh, ads for books that are convincing me that doom is coming, uh, that we're going to see a crash that takes us back to, well, let's see, was it 1341? Uh, the, height, the height of the Black Death uh, in Europe where the European population, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I actually, I've seen, an ad, I've gotten an ad for, for somebody that compares where we're looking at to the Dark Ages. Um, and I don't know whether they're talking about the real Dark Ages, like 560 or merely 1340 or so, but you know, hey, you know, half the population of the country dies from the Black Death. I think it's a pretty, pretty negative event. Um, but one of the things that, that, you know, it's easy to make fun of those guys, uh, but they, they do have one thing going on, very, very true, which is that the central banks have dug themselves into a deep hole and it's hard, for them to, it's hard for us to see, it's hard for anyone to see how they dig themselves out of the hole. That, you know, the Fed basically added $4 trillion to its balance sheet. The Fed is currently trying, trying very hard and not being very successful to raise interest rates by 25 basis points. Uh, okay, this is, these are two entirely different scales, 25 basis points, $4 trillion. Um, it's hard to see how you, you get back to something like normal without big, big, big uh, disruptions. Uh, it's now become pretty much the consensus that uh, the Japanese are not gonna be able to wipe out their government debt, they're not gonna be able to pay it off ever, uh, and that what they're doing right now is undeclared uh, monetization of their debt. But basically, you know, you're talking about trying to get up to up to an inflation rate, which starts to eat away at the value of the debt, uh, and your current and, and devalue your currency, so it eats away at the value of your debt. Because there's no way that this country, with its declining population, uh, is going to be able to pay this off. So you're looking at that and going, well, we really don't know what this looks like. Uh, we don't know what a period of long deflation of with central banks uh, contracting the money supply. We have a fairly good idea that if the Fed starts to contract the dollars available to the world economy, that uh, emerging markets such as Brazil uh, are gonna be for very tough times. The world really runs on dollars and it, growth depends on us pumping out more dollars. And it's one of the things that um, our political campaigns don't seem to deal with, which is that we may wanna be you know, militarily isolationist, but in terms of fi finances, we can't be because the world runs on dollars. Um, and there are advantages to that. We get to fund our debt at very low levels, but the world really depends on us doing that. Uh, if we suddenly stop, what happens? Don't know. We do know that um, the big um, drop in interest rates that started with Volcker, where he took rates from 17% uh, to where we are now, at essentially zero, is unlikely to repeat itself in the future that it's unlikely that we're gonna go from zero to a negative 17. Um, so we're looking at, at, again, that was a great period for being an investor. Uh, one of the things that I urge you to think about when you, if you have a financial planner or talk to a financial planner or try to do financial planning is that one of the great things about being a financial planner in the period of, of the 80s and 90s was that you could be incredibly wrong in terms of asset allocations and not have it hurt your clients. That if you put people in, if you, if you decided that you did your formulas and you decided that your clients couldn't take on much risk and you put them in government bonds, they did as well as if they were in stocks. And actually in some periods of that, of a longer period, they did better. There was no penalty for getting that wrong. Going forward, I think we're looking at a period where getting things wrong um, 
and I don't know what getting things right is gonna be, but I know that getting things wrong is gonna be painful, there are gonna be real consequences. Deciding that you wanna over allocate bonds is not gonna produce 5.5% a year in returns. Um, no way in this going forward. Uh, we're looking at some, some emerging markets hit the wall. Um, there's a thing called the middle income trap. It's relatively easy, relatively easy, to go from being really, really poor to being uh, less poor, uh, to get over, to get into the next category, to go from being uh, China to being a South Korea is a lot harder. Um, relatively few countries make that uh, leap without a lot of time. Uh, and we've got a large number of world global economies that are ex actually at that point, that China is, is now trying to get from being much less poor to being South Korea. Um, and it's really hard. It requires major reforms of your economic system and your financial system. The Chinese are showing no interest in actually doing that because it would, it would disrupt the control of the Communist Party. Um, but that's going to make that really hard. Um, Brazil, uh, uh, last, last night, yesterday, uh, basically impeached its president, uh, uh, mired in tremendous, tremendous corruption, political turmoil. You've got low growth, uh, runaway inflation, uh, and no, cent no political center that will hold. Uh, how Brazil gets to be a middle-income middle country, I don't know. Uh, and you've got vast overcapacity in commodities. One of the, the side effects, major side effects, huge side effects of all the central bank money was there was a lot of money to invest in, in productive capacity, um, and people did, and now we've got overcapacity uh, in things like iron ore um, that's not going to go away. Uh, it's going to be with us for a while, and that's going to make, it's, it's very hard to figure out how those, those um, do it. New complicating factors, um, demographics, uh, to talk about the Black Plague uh, is, you know, we don't worry about that. But one of the things that the world is, where the world has never been is the world has never been this old. The world has never, you know, and the world has never had this many people on it, but it's also never gotten this old. Um, because we usually kill, kill ourselves off before this. We have a big war or a plague or whatever, but we're, we're apparently not going to do that this time. So we're going to enter into this new exciting experience. I'd much, better, much rather be old than dead. Uh, as, as two alternatives, so that strikes, old strikes me as pretty good. Uh, but as, as a world economy, uh, a world political system, we have no experience in this. We're, we're moving into uncharted territory. Uh, it should be really interesting. Okay. Um, what do you do about this? Uh, I'm not a trader. Uh, I'm learning how to be an investor in an environment where volatility is really high and trading is, is high. Um, so I'm paying attention to when trades get crowded and trying to, to avoid those. You can see, you know, if you simply consume financial press headlines, you can see when trades start to get crowded. Um, one of the things also is, is that, you know, I don't think you want to, even, even in volatility, you don't want to play the extremes, but if you're looking at um, a VIX which ranges from 11 to 50, 51 or, or so, you don't have to play the extremes. You can play inside the middle and it's much safer. Um, on Jubeck Picks, I've, uh, on my subscription site, which is jam.com, jubeckam.com, um, started to do some trades uh, in volatility and, and picking my spots very, very carefully. So we did one back in uh, 2015 where we, where we managed to catch the, um, the, the complacency before the August uh, sell-off and get the August and catch the August sell-off and basically uh, put people, you know, recommended, um, you know, buying, buying the VIX using options when the VIX was at 12.20 uh, and, and then recommended selling it at, at 14.21. It went higher than that, um, but I'm perfectly willing to give up that last 15 or 10 or 15 points on the VIX if you get that kind of thing in between. Uh, put that trade back on again. Um, last week. Um, and the other thing about this is that the market is, you know, if in a high volatility market you're getting overreaction. Uh, if you remember when Amazon came out in with its uh, fourth quarter 2015 earnings and it instead of producing uh, 85 cents on the plus side, it went back to the bad old days and showed, you know, 15 or 20 cents or a loss or whatever that and the stock just cratered. Uh, it's back to where it was. Uh, you get these extreme overreactions of short-term events in a volatile market. Uh, those are worth 
trading. Uh, and I'm trying to learn new tricks, quite frankly. Um, and uh, the people, some of the people on, on my site are, are much better at this than I am, um, but I'm getting up to speed. Uh, so covered calls is a way to uh, make some income and to increase the amount you get on, on dividends. Uh, from the current low rate. I mean, one of the problems for, for income investors right now is that, um, you know, getting, f getting even 4% is hard. Um, for a lot of people, financial plans, 4% is not going to do it. Uh, so how do you, you get more out of that and covered calls is a way to do that. Uh, volatility ETFs, uh, when I did the most recent VIX trade, uh, looked at doing it not with using options, but with using ETFs, the trade, uh, this trades the, these two trade the, v, the VIX. The first one, VIXY, is the short term VIX. It uses, it tracks the, the short term, like a month or two months. Uh, the second one, VIXM, is, is a, a mid term, uh, tracks the VIX over like three months, four months. So, uh, and then last is trying to do some hedging. Um, for the first time ever, I've added some hedges in the portfolio, uh, shorting the S&P, shorting the emerging markets. Uh, the EEM uh, uh, index. Uh, you can do these with ETFs. It's relatively, I mean, it's easy. Timing is hard. Um, I got the timing wrong on both of these. We're both down about 10%, but we've been clawing our way back from being down 20%. So I still think being short uh, on these two things over the summer would be a good idea. I just wish I'd held off and not done it in February, but done it now. Um, so those are some of my thoughts. Uh, there's more stuff about volatility in the book. Uh, probably sometime around uh, the 1st of July, I'll be, be launching a site that goes with the book to try to keep it up to date, uh, because you can't write about volatility as if the world is not changing at all. So I'll be launching a new site and announcing that. It'll be, it'll be free to people who buy the book. Um, there's a secret code in the book uh, that'll get you into the site. But anyway, so I've got about, oh, we've got about eight minutes, so questions? Yeah, where do you think that is going to be the test where I think the economy will be six months? Uh, two and a half percent GDP growth. Uh, two and a half percent GDP growth. Yeah, two and a half. I don't see three and a half. The global economy is too weak. Um, you know, I, I see the first quarter, which was what, 0.7 percent growth as being um, an anomaly. Uh, why this is true, but over the last two years, the first quarter has been really uh, the weakest quarter of the year by far. Um, it's just hard for me to see where a lot of growth is coming from. If we're seeing, you know, in technology, we see slow, you know, slow growth in PCs, slow growth in smartphones, uh, you know. Yeah, but that, that, that's much higher than we had the last year. What? A lot higher than the last 12 months. What is? No, two and a half percent is the last last uh, two is two two and a half is 2015. That's that was what we did last in that year. So it's it's not, you know, it's it's slow growth. I mean, the U.S. economy should be growing at more like three three and a half, um, but I don't see that happening. Where do you see gold and silver going in the next year? And the gold and silver mining stocks. Uh, well, if if you're looking at so much, so much of that depends on what what your. Let's go back one, you know. So that's sort of the end, the end of a question that. The other question of that is, what do I see the Fed doing? Because the Fed raises rates more quickly than people are. I mean, right now the the market is based is pricing in uh, a one or none uh, scenario for one or no uh, increases in interest rates in 2016. If that turns out to be true, um, then I think gold prices continue to go up. Uh, and gold mining stocks uh, should do relatively well. If if that if that uh, assumption is wrong, um, then I think gold will will sort of stagnate. I don't think gold is going down because I think there's a sense that the world is a riskier place than it used to be. Um, but I wouldn't see it going up from there if under that scenario. Anybody else? Go. Yeah.
<laughs> um, it either ends really badly or it ends in a trading, a trading pattern that, that um, is you know, intermittently really, really scary. Um, you know, I, 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 you know this, this is not good stuff. Um, you know, there's, there's no doubt about that. Um, whether it's whether it's you know uh, horrendously bad stuff or we muddle muddle along, uh, I think is really the, the question. Um, you know, if 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 you if you put that scenario sort of that's the developed market scenario um, together with the pro the scenario in the emerging markets, which is that you're not seeing you know huge returns to growth. I mean, you're not looking at China growing at 10 percent. You're not looking at Brazil getting to six. Um, so where's the demand coming from? Um, it's hard to see um, a scenario that doesn't involve higher interest rates and you know low growth, um, which is not a good you know not a, not a good uh, environment. I mean the, the the one thing that worries me about the market right now um, is is that we're in a real uh, earnings desert. Uh, corporate earnings are not going up. Um, you know, that we're, we're looking at a, the possibility that we'll see a big rebound in earnings in the second half of 2016, which is sort of keeping people okay about the market, is really based on, on a big uptick in oil prices to maybe 65. Uh, if that doesn't happen, then we're not looking at earnings growth in 2016 again. Um, so all of that's pretty negative stuff. Um, and if you're looking at, you know, there's a whole, a whole third of the book is, is really devoted to um, not so much financial markets as, as things like longer term trends like in housing or pensions or demographics or whatever. Um, and, you know, if you look at, at, at um, you know, the, the, Puerto, the, the, Puerto, the, the Puerto Rico um, debt crisis right now um, is, um, Replicable, I mean, is, is a model that unfortunately can be applied to uh, states like Illinois and New Jersey. Um, so, you, you know, and you say that that's not just simply trying to get an extra dollar out of public, public sector workers, but, but trying to reduce pensions across the board pretty much for everybody, even though the few people have it left. It does. It really does. And, and you know, um, for people outside the public sector, this has already happened. I mean, you know, basically, you know, I don't know anybody who still has a defined benefits uh, pension plan. Uh, you know, everybody has 401ks with nothing in them. Uh, that's the, the pattern across the United States. And, and that's, that's really hard to see how this works. I mean, if the average pe person has $40,000 put away for, for retirement, um, this, this doesn't, you know, produce a lot of consumer spending. Well, the old, old aging of the generation, a lot of the spending that they hope to uh, stimulate the economy comes from uh, those people and the, their pension funds go away. Right. They're not going to be spent. Right. Right. And that's part of the engine that keeps capitalism working. <laughs> Ecuador looks really good right now. Ecuador looks really good. It's a very low retirement. Uh, I, I'm serious. I'm serious. I now subscribe to a thing called, you know, the, you know, uh, the international living, and I'm really, really interested in this because it's like, okay, you can, you know, your, if your social security, if your social security benefit right now, when you retire, is going to be like $2,500 a month, uh, which is what mine will be if I ever get to retire. Um, you know, can't live, can't live on that in Manhattan, certainly. Can't live on that in most places in the United States. But you can live quite well in Ecuador. Um, and, you know, and, and this is becoming a viable option for, you know, or not a viable option, the only option for a lot of people. I mean, this, I, I would think that if there was some way to buy stock in this, this magazine uh, about this, I would buy it because it, it's, yeah, anyway, you over there. No, I, don't, I, I, I find currencies right now really hard to hedge. Uh, you know, the, the smart currency guys have gotten it wrong uh, pretty much this year. Uh, if you've, I mean, and I don't much like um, Goldman Sachs uh, either because I think that they, they have too much in the way of conflict of interest, but I follow their, 
their recommendations. They had, they had um, a stronger dollar as one of their top 10 trades for 2016. Uh, at the end of 2015, they took it off uh, in February. They put it back on last week. Uh, I think that's an indication that the currency markets are really, really hard to trade right now, so I'm not trying. Um, if you could find somebody that you're, you're uh, I wouldn't buy a fund. I wouldn't buy a, a, a junk bond fund. Uh, I might be willing to buy, into, you know, I, because I, I don't, you know, I don't know that I trust their due diligence. Uh, and that's what you were looking at. You're looking at a very uh, tough market for these companies, depending on, on individual company uh, debt and management. So I'd rather, I'd ra you know, I'd feel more comfortable doing it myself. Um, the other thing is, is, you know, if there are, uh, you're getting extreme shifts in uh, credit ratings credit ra for, for sovereign debt outside the United States. Um, we've seen Brazil claw its way up to investment grade and now back down to junk. Um, Mexico, Colombia, uh, volatile in the same way. I mean, that's another place I might be looking to try to get some, some combination of some yield as well as if you're looking, if you can find a company, country where you think the, the prospects going forward are better, uh, Mexico strikes me as one where I think they are going to get their oil act together, so I might look there. Uh, but junk is really hard right now. The risk is just tremendous. I think the problem with beta is that it's not very reliable at the moment, so yes, um, that, that, uh, what? Uh, you want to re restate your question? Yeah, I think the, the problem is that beta is, for individual companies, beta is, you know, beta at the moment, beta is a, is a historical look, look back uh, and tr trying to predict what, it, you know, and trying to extrapolate that into the future for an individual company and its stock performance. Uh, I, find, I find that um, not, very, not very reliable going forward. It's, it's just shifting too much for individual companies. Um, so, I mean, who thought, who, I mean, uh, at the moment, I would argue, for example, that Disney, which I never think, I don't think of Disney as a high beta stock. I would argue at the moment, because of the problems they're having at ESPN uh, and in some of the, the cable business, Disney has turned into a high beta stock for the moment. Um, and you're getting overreaction because the market is overreacting to volatility. So I think beta is, is shaky at the moment. Okay. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for listening uh, and entertaining me. Uh, thanks a lot. <laughs>